Ship show. Today is the Wisconsin primary, but Donald Trump has been getting a lot of flack in the media over the last couple of days about his comments about the U.S. economy, particularly in the financial media, because Donald Trump has now predicted a very massive recession in the United States. Now, he didn't just say a recession. He's predicting a massive recession recession. And of course, most of the pundits on television don't see any recession at all, not even a mild one. So here you have Donald Trump saying not only is the recession going to be massive, but actually it's going to be very massive. So in other words, this is not going to be your run of the mill massive recession, which by itself means it's going to be a lot larger than a normal recession that's not massive. But Donald Trump went out of his way to say that this massive recession is going to be very massive. And, you know, massive already means pretty big. So when you're talking very massive, I mean, what are you talking about? Are you talking about Great Recession a la 2008, 2009? Was that a very massive recession or is that just your garden variety massive recession? You know, maybe a very massive recession is a depression. But either way, you've got some gruesome economic news, right, at least forecasted by Donald Trump. And the media is all over Trump. What is he talking about? Right. The economy is in great shape. Right. He's peddling all kinds of fiction. I mean, we have this massive uh, economic growth. The president was on television today talking about inversions. I'll get to that later in the podcast. But at the beginning, he took credit for this great economy with all these years of jobs, because he referenced the jobs numbers that I spoke about in my podcast on Friday about this record string of job creation. Of course, what the president doesn't admit to is it's not job creation, it's job destruction. We're destroying full-time jobs. The byproduct of that destruction is that we create a bunch of part-time jobs that people don't really want, but that's all they can get. Yet the president is taking credit for that. It's like setting a fire and then taking credit for putting it out. Well, yeah, that's what the Federal Reserve did with the 2008 financial crisis. I guess if something works, you stick with it. That seems like a pretty good thing to cause a lot of problems and then take credit for potentially solving them. Yes, so Obama caused a huge problem. He destroyed a bunch of full-time jobs, but now he can take credit for creating all the part-time jobs that replaced the full-time jobs that his policies destroyed. But let's look at some of the economic news that came out over the past couple of days that resulted in the Atlanta Fed reducing its estimate for first quarter GDP yet again to 0.4, 0.4 on Friday when I recorded my podcast and I said that I thought they would be revising it down based on the numbers that had just come out. They did. They did today, and now it's down at 0.4. One of the reasons that the Atlanta Fed cited for this revision were the factory orders that came out yesterday. February factory orders were supposed to be down 1.6. Instead, they came out as down 1.7, which was not that big a miss until you consider the revisions downward from the January, the previous month, which was originally reported as up 1.6, but now it was revised to only being up 1.2. So the drop, which was bigger than expected, we fell from a lower level, which means it's a bigger drop. And so that took something out of the uh, GDP numbers, as did the very, very bad auto sales that I did mention, I believe, on the Friday podcast. So between the uh, weak auto sales and the weak factory orders, the Atlanta Fed went down to 0.4. Now, apparently the Worse than expected trade deficit that came out today didn't even factor into their thinking. And I don't know why, because we were supposed to get $46.2 billion, and instead we got $47.1 billion. That's a pretty big miss. That's higher than even the worst estimate that anybody had. And they took last month's deficit, which was originally $45.7, and they upped that one to $46.2. That was January. And so we still have, you know, the March number that we're going to get, which will ultimately be factored into the first quarter GDP. So I think they're still not low enough. I think they still got to take this thing down. And remember, too, one of the things that's helping, helping 
the GDP numbers for the first quarter is the, or was the, because the quarter's over now, but was the unseasonably warm weather that you had in most of the country. Because the numbers assume that the weather is cold because it's generally cold in the winter. So there are all these seasonal adjustments that subtract from GDP or that add back to GDP activity that they think didn't take place because of the cold weather. Well, if it turns out the weather wasn't really cold and that activity took place anyway, then the seasonal adjustments are going to be wrong. So the reality is that the seasonal adjustments could be helping to overestimate an already weak GDP for the first quarter. But those seasonal adjustments won't be there to help out the numbers in the second quarter. And of course, the other thing that helps out the numbers is the inflation numbers, which dramatically underestimate the true cost of living. You know, just uh, for fun, I put a, I linked to an article on my Facebook page today about the, the cost of a wedding. Because, of course, the cost of getting married is massive. I mean, the wedding is probably the cheapest part of it. It gets a lot more expensive from there. But the cost of the wedding itself has gone up now for five consecutive years and is at an all-time record high. It's $32,641 for the average wedding. And that's up 4.6% from last year. Now, this is happening in an environment where there's no inflation. No inflation. Yet... The price of a wedding, which obviously is not in the CPI, ne neither must any of the things in the wedding. Because what's in the wedding? Flowers, photographers, um, you know, food, uh, you know, a band. You got to rent, uh, you know, a, a hotel room, whatever. I mean, I guess none of the stuff that's in the wedding actually shows up in a CPI either. But in any event, this is without inflation. The cost of the wedding is up 4.6%. Imagine how much worse it would be if we had inflation. Right, because this is what's happening with no inflation at all. Probably the worst thing, though, about the wedding is how much college debt both the bride and the groom have. Hopefully, they're not borrowing the money for the wedding. Right Now, maybe the, the bride's parents are borrowing the money for the wedding. But because nobody has the money, who's got $32,000 saved up in America? Nobody. No one has any savings. So th all this stuff is being put on, on a credit card. So imagine what's going to happen when, when interest rates go up and you know the cost of servicing this gets even higher. But my point was that you know the wedding, obviously, wedding prices going up is an indication that there's inflation that the government is not fessing up to. But that's one of the reasons that the GDP numbers look like they're going up, even though they're going down. But the bottom line is, it looks like Donald Trump is on to something, right? He's talking about this massive recession, this very massive recession, Everybody else is saying he's nuts because the economy is great. Look at the numbers. The numbers tell a different story. And I believe that Trump is wrong. I don't think we're headed for a massive recession. I think we're already in a massive recession. We're just at the beginning of it. right? And so it's going to get more and more massive as it matures. But right now, it's just the beginning. And, you know, by the way, because everybody is, you know, criticizing Trump saying, well, you know, he's saying there's a massive recession coming, but nobody is forecasting it. Yes, nobody ever forecasts it. Nobody forecast the Great Recession of 2008 either. You know, at this time in 2008, in April of 2008, even though we were already in recession, the forecasts for GDP for the first quarter of 2008 were much higher than they are right now for the first quarter of 2016. And the forecasts for the entire year were more optimistic, more rosy than what the forecasts are right now. So if people were so clueless about this great economy that they saw in 2008, when we were already in a great recession, then why is it so hard to believe that the same people have been fooled again and that Donald Trump is right, that we are on the verge of a great recession? The problem is, his policies might make that recession worse, but that's a whole nother story. The important thing is that at least he recognizes that there's a problem. Forgetting about whether or not he's going to make the problem worse, the important thing is at least knowing that it exists. And I think, obviously, the people voting for Donald Trump know that it exists. And the people voting for Bernie Sanders, who, by the way, Bernie Sanders is probably going to win tonight in the Wisconsin primary. Donald Trump is not the favorite. He is a trailing in the polls. But the fact that he's got so much support in that state, it's all because the economy is a wreck. If the economy wasn't a wreck, 
his message would not be resonating because people are, are willing to overlook all sorts of obvious problems that they might see in a Trump presidency on the belief that maybe he can do something about their horrible economic situation because at least he's telling the truth about how bad things are. In fact, he's actually sugarcoating it, although you know maybe he doesn't realize that it's even worse than he thinks, but at least he's saying that. He's saying that we need to make America great again because he knows that it's not great anymore. And the people who are voting for Donald Trump know that America is no longer great and they want it to be great. And they're hoping that maybe voting for Donald Trump could do that because voting for anybody else won't. Because what's the difference? Even though maybe Ted Cruz, relative to most of the other Republicans who have been at the head of a ticket, right? If you look at the people that we've nominated, like John McCain, uh, or George Bush, recent Republican nominees. I mean, Ted Cruz is miles above those guys, at least what he's talking about, right? You know, going to a flat tax and the, the things that he wants to do and cut government programs and cut government spending and honor the Constitution. At least he's saying this stuff. Usually the Republican nominees sound just like Democrats. At least he sounds different. So at least he'd be a decent nominee. But most people realize that, look, these guys are, are still not going to represent game changers because they're still part of the system, right? Even if um, if Ted Cruz has been a, a cog in the wheel of the system for the entire time he's been in the system, he's still in it. Donald Trump is not in it. I mean, you could say on the outskirts, yeah, he's there buying influence from all the politicians who peddle it, but the perception is he's an outsider, he's not a politician, he's self-funding, and that is the glimmer of hope that all these desperate, angry, angry voters have. And it was interesting, too, that, you know, Steve Leisman was doing his thing on CNBC about the angry voter. And as far as he's concerned, he doesn't know why they're angry because he thinks everything is great. He doesn't think they have anything to be angry about, right? He thinks they should all be happy because the economy is so good. Well, that is exactly what everybody was saying in early 2008. And I remember it because I was doing all these television shows. I was doing a lot more television shows back then than I am now. They had me on all the time before the financial crisis. So I remember all these guys argue with me. Although I will be on CNBC tomorrow with Rick Santelli, who is one of my favorite guys on CNBC, who kind of partially gets it, right? And he does argue with this guy, Steve Leesman, a lot. Um, and I will be on with him live tomorrow, so make sure and tune in to listen to that. Now, the stock market had a pretty rough day today. In fact, it got started, uh, basically, the Obama administration coming out and putting the kibosh right, on an inversion with, um, with, with Pfizer and Allergan. And first of all, you know, there's no way that it is constitutional for the president, for the executive— to come out with an executive order to basically alter the tax code. I mean, the tax code is the tax code. I mean, if it's going to be changed, it needs to be changed through a legislative process. It needs to go through the House and the Senate. I mean, if the president could just change the rules on what what's taxable income and what's not, and right? well, I mean, what then what do we even need Congress for? And right? so the whole thing is ridiculous that Nobody even challenges the authority of the president to do this, yet he issues this executive order. If this is true, if Ted Cruz becomes president, why doesn't he just abolish the whole IRS by executive order? Why doesn't he take us to a flat tax by executive order? If President Obama can, can change the law so that a corporation can't legally do one of these inversions, which the law says they can do, and now the president just on his own by decree can change the tax law, well, why, why not change the whole thing? Why not abolish it completely, right? If you can do that, there's no limit to what you can do. But that got the stock market off to a weak start because this uh, Allegrin was down big. It was down 15% on the day because of this. This is one of the most heavily owned stocks among hedge funds because I guess it was an easy trade, right? Everybody's trying to make some easy money. You think these guys are smart. They're paid two and 20, but they're really not so smart, right? But they just put on this trade. It's an arbitrage because it's a takeover, right? So you just buy the stock and you wait for the deal, right? But anyway, there is no deal. The deal just got killed. And so now the stock collapses. All the hedge funds are going to have to lick their wounds. They had a horrible first quarter and now they're starting off the second quarter uh, with another big problem. And by the way, technically, the market looked very, very weak today. 
There was some big selling that came in near the close. The Dow made the low within the last five or 10 minutes of trading. We were maybe down 150, 160. We only closed down 133, so not quite on the low, but that really was the low. I mean, the Dow was down maybe 140 at one point earlier in the day and then snapped back, but we really went right down to the low. And as they were selling stocks on the low, they were buying gold. Gold really caught a bid. It was up all day, uh, but then caught a bid at the end of the day to close near the highs of the day, although it was up about 19 bucks at one point early this morning. It spent most of the day maybe up about 8 to 10 bucks, but it managed to close up around $16 on the day. Gold stocks also very strong today. One of the big stories, I think, was the Japanese yen. Very strong. What, a year and a half high on the Japanese yen. This is another problem for the hedge funds because they're short the yen. And of course, you know, this is, you know, the hedge funds are a bunch of carry traders. They borrow in yen and then they buy riskier assets. Well, the yen is going up. This is causing a lot of pain. And it's not just the yen that's going up. It's the Swiss franc that was going up too. So this shows some stress in the system. And I think there's a good chance that this relief rally that we had based on the Fed backtracking, is over. And now we're going down for another decline. And in fact, one of the interesting parts about this recent rally is there was a lot of short covering. Because a lot of the shorts piled into the market in January when they saw how the market was going down and when they expected four rate hikes because you know the Fed said they're going to raise rates four times. And so a bunch of people piled in short. Once the Fed backtracked, the shorts covered because you'll notice that the biggest rallies that we had in the last five or six weeks were among the most heavily shorted stocks, right? The stocks that everybody liked the least, those are the ones that rose the most. The stocks that everybody liked, everybody's favorite stocks, they didn't do so well. It was the ones everybody was shorting that rallied because it was a short covering rally. Well, I think that rally is over and I think the market is rolling over because I said before, that just not raising rates is not going to cut it. What the Federal Reserve is going to have to do is cut rates back to zero because the specter is still out there. Even if the Fed is dialing back, you know, when we're going to hike, how soon we're going to hike, how much we're going to hike, the talk is still about a hike and when the hike comes. And that's not enough. The market needs cheap money. The drug addicts need more drugs. They don't need to talk about a timetable for when their drugs are going to get taken away. That's not the conversation. It's when are we going to get more? When are we going to get more drugs? Because if we don't get more drugs, we're going to have that massive recession more obvious before the election rather than after the election. And so if the Federal Reserve wants to keep Donald Trump out of the White House, right, or even keep him from getting the Republican nomination, because the worse the economy is, the more Republican votes he's going to get, right? The more Democrats are going to cross over and vote for him in the Republican primary if they can, or, or independents. They're going to have to backtrack. And if they want to stop this bear market, and this is a bear market, but for the Fed, right? If it wasn't for the Fed backtracking, we would have still been declining, right? We were off to the worst start ever, and we would have continued had the Fed not backtracked. But they have got to do the complete 180, right? Not just slow down. They got to do an about face. They got to take away that rate hike. They got to go back to zero. They got to launch QE4. I don't know that they have to go negative. They might not have to do that. I think they probably will eventually because why not? Everybody else has done it. Japan has done it. Europe has done it. Why would we be any smarter? If they're dumb enough to do it, we're certainly dumb enough to do it. At least we're dumb enough to try, right? Because it's a desperate move when all else fails. Well, everything they're going to do is going to fail. So rather than do the right thing, you have to do everything that you can possibly do wrong before you do anything right. So we're probably going to get that. Whether we get it before the election is another thing. But that's what we're going to have to do, I think, in order to keep the market from actually being down 20%, you know, an official bear market before the election. And there's no way they want that. And Hillary Clinton doesn't want to run in a bear market. And of course, the other thing that they're concerned about is even though Hillary Clinton is way ahead in the polls, Bernie Sanders is not completely out of this thing. And the, you know, the administration, the Fed, they don't want Sanders on the top of that ticket. Because again, he's an outsider. They want Hillary Clinton. Right. And so 
the worse the economy is, the more votes Bernie's going to get. And so they got to make sure to keep Bernie off of that ticket and keep Hillary on. Although I don't know why, because I, I still think that if it's Hillary versus Trump, everybody is saying Trump doesn't have a chance. He's got a chance. He's got a better chance against Hillary than he does against uh, against Sanders. That's a tough call. He might not be able to beat Sanders, even though he's a socialist. Socialism doesn't have the bad ring that it used to. Not with this dumbed down electorate. So Trump has got a better path to the White House against a a criminal insider like Hillary. Right? At least people can think Sanders has some integrity. At least they can think he's an honest guy. Even though he might be completely wrong about everything or most everything, he might come across as sincere. And that's going to be tough for Trump to run against. But Hillary Clinton, I mean, she's an easy target. She, I mean, she could even be indicted. But in order to make sure that it's Hillary, they got to keep this house of cards from collapsing while Obama is still the president. Because he's got to be able to keep peddling that fiction. He's got to be able to tell this tale about the greatest recovery in the history of recoveries, according to him, how he inherited his disaster. And thanks to his brilliant policies and his wise stewardship of this economy, that everything is great. And maybe just a few little things could be improved. And the way to do that is to elect Hillary Clinton to continue his legacy. That whole narrative falls apart if the stock market crashes and the economy blows up. And the only way to prevent that from happening before the election is for the Fed to intervene. There's no way to prevent it, right? That very massive recession that Donald Trump is talking about, it's coming. In fact, it's probably already here. It's just that nobody wants the voters to realize it before they vote. But I have to say the award for the stupidest investment story of the week goes to the Wall Street Journal for its article about gold. The title of the article, A Warning for Gold Bugs. This rally won't last. So a warning from the Wall Street Journal. Well, you know, when the Wall Street Journal warns me about buying gold, I feel a lot better about owning it. Here's the subtitle. The enthusiasm surrounding gold's big first quarter rally suggests its shine is set to dull sooner rather than later. What enthusiasm? There's no enthusiasm. That's just it. If there was enthusiasm, we wouldn't be reading stories like this in the Wall Street Journal. In fact, the whole rally, you had uh, Wall Street saying, get short. Look at that guy, Curry, the, the head commodities guy at Goldman Sachs. I saw Jeff Curry on today again, today again on CNBC, saying his best idea was to short gold. So there hasn't been a lot of enthusiasm. Gold has rallied despite a lack of enthusiasm. That's one of the things that the guy that wrote this article just doesn't understand. But here is the biggest part he doesn't understand. And I'm not making this up, right? I mean, if you think I'm making it up, just go and read the article for yourself. I put it on my Facebook page. But here is the problem. He lays it out, right? He says, I'm reading this. The problem is these theories don't take into account a fundamental analysis of gold's intrinsic value. It doesn't really have any. Say what? Gold doesn't have any intrinsic value? Does this guy not understand the word intrinsic value? You know, if you're going to criticize gold, its lack of intrinsic value cannot be your criticism. Because when you're criticizing gold, you're defending the alternative, which is paper money, which is a paper dollar. Well, if you're saying gold's no good because it doesn't have any intrinsic value, what is the intrinsic value in irredeemable paper money? What is the intrinsic value of a Federal Reserve note that gives you nothing? I mean, all you can get for a 10 is two fives. Where is the intrinsic value? I mean, what intrinsic value means is value in and of itself, separate from its value as a medium of exchange, right? So when you say money has intrinsic value, that means separated from its monetary functions, you could do something with it. Gold is a highly valuable commodity. It's valuable for all sorts of reasons. It has a lot of functionality. It has a lot of properties that are very unique to gold. And the only reason gold became money is because it was desirable as a commodity before it became money. And it was universally accepted. 
I mean, everywhere in the world, every culture valued gold. So if you wanted to exchange something for something else, gold was universally accepted. That's one of the reasons it works so well as money. And it has a lot of other properties that lend it to being money more so than, than other commodities. But even if it's not money, you can do something with it. Right? You can use your gold. If you don't spend it, you can melt it down. You can make something out of it. What can you do with paper money? I mean, if you don't spend it, if you just stuck with it, what can you do with it? I mean, can you burn it in the fire for warmth? You know, it's not going to generate much uh, much heat, right? Those little bills, they're not going to, you know, they'll be, they'll, they'll be gone in seconds. You can't write on it because it's already got ink on it. I've, I've joked maybe if they printed it on softer stock, you could use it as toilet paper. But basically, I, I forget who said this. But the quote is that only government can take a valuable property, valuable commodity like paper, slap ink on it and render it worthless because paper money has zero intrinsic value. That's one of the problems with it. It has no value in and of itself. Gold has intrinsic value. So you can't point to, you can't criticize gold by saying it has no intrinsic value because now you're criticizing fiat. If you think something, money needs intrinsic value, then you've automatically excluded dollars and euros and yen because that's where there's no intrinsic value. Gold is all intrinsic value. You know, only somebody who writes for the Wall Street Journal, right? Somebody maybe who's got a college degree and who's a financial journalist could be dumb enough not to understand that. But here's part of the problem because I'll finish that, that paragraph because after he says that gold doesn't have any intrinsic value, he says, Unlike many financial assets, such as stocks, bonds, real estate, or others, gold doesn't generate any income. So valuing it is impossible. So here, he's comparing gold to income-producing assets. Well, first of all, there are plenty of stocks that don't pay dividends either. Right? Plenty of stocks on the NASDAQ, on the Russell 2000, that don't pay any dividends. And people buy raw land, they don't collect any rent. And so just because gold doesn't throw off any dividends doesn't mean it doesn't have intrinsic value, right? Raw land has intrinsic value, even if it, it doesn't generate any rent. And so does a corporation, even if it doesn't pay a dividend. But what about the yen? What's the yield on the yen? Oh, it's negative. What about on the euro? Well, that yield is negative too. So not only don't the euro or the yen pay a dividend, you actually have to pay to hold it. You've got a negative rate. Well, isn't zero better than negative? Isn't something that pays no interest better than something that charges you interest? Because zero is a higher number than a negative number. So gold has a higher yield than the yen. It has a higher yield than the euro. Now, for now, the dollar has a higher nominal yield than gold, but if you subtract a, le a legitimate rate of inflation, the yield on the dollar is negative too. Because if you hold a dollar, if you put it in the bank, you get no interest, right? So that's still zero, right? You've got negative interest rates in Europe or Japan, but if you deposit dollars in the bank, you get no interest there either, right? So dollars don't yield anything just like gold. But the problem is they're printing a lot of dollars. They're not mining a lot of gold. So the supply of dollars keeps going up. So the real yield on dollars is negative after inflation. That's not the case for gold. Right, if you bought gold uh, in 2000 and you've held on to it for the last 16 years, you got a lot more purchasing power today than you had 16 years ago. If you buried your dollar bills in the ground, that's not the case. So when these guys want to compare gold to stocks or bonds, they're comparing apples to oranges. You want to compare apples to apples? You compare gold to the dollar. You compare gold to the euro, gold to the yen. Those are your alternatives. It's not a choice between gold and stocks. It's a choice between gold and other forms of money, other money substitutes, fiat currency. You still want to invest in stocks. Now, let's say you think the stock market is too expensive and you don't want to invest in the stock market. You want to, you want to be in something safe. You want to be in money. You want to be in cash. You want to be in liquidity while you're waiting for stock prices to come down. Now, your alternatives are, I can wait out this decline in the dollar. I can wait it out in the euro or I can wait it out in gold. And gold wins hands down. If you don't want to be in stocks, if you don't want to be in real estate because you think those markets are overpriced and you just want to park your liquidity, now you consider gold. You compare gold to other liquid assets. 
right, that maybe don't have a yield either at this point, like the dollar or the euro. If you want to buy stocks, if you want to buy real estate, you can buy it and you can use your gold to pay for it. But this article is complete and other nonsense. And the fact that it can be written and on what the, it was on the front page of what the, the B section of the Wall Street Journal. This this is the kind of stuff that you're going to see in a huge bull market. In fact, gold was up, what, 16 bucks, I said today. It's probably going to be up a lot more. Maybe this is the article that's going to fuel the next leg of the bear market. I can't wait for this guy to write another one. And I can't wait for Curry to have to come out again. Short it, short it, short it. Because when these guys say to buy, when these guys finally throw in the towel and recommend buying gold, that's when it's probably going to have a correction. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.